Welcome to Game Changers. I'm Noam Weissman, the head of education at Unpacked. And today we have Sarah Hurwitz with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Sarah is the former head speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama and President Barack Obama, as well as the author for Here All Along. Here's the book right here. Check it out. I want to thank all of our partners. Uh, you see yourselves on the screen for joining us to launch this episode of our new series, Game Changers. Thank you so much for partnering with us and making this all possible. Sarah, I'm going to get right into it with you. Let's do it. Are you ready? Ready. All right, let's do this. So let me ask you, it's impossible uh, to, to ignore, or it's impossible not to start by having you tell us a little bit about your career. Before we get to the book, give us, yes. your, fa give us your fast track, your, your professional bio. What are the various stops you made along the way to your years in the White House? Yeah, so I actually got my start as an intern in Vice President Al Gore's speechwriting office in the White House in the summer of 98. The writers I worked for helped me get my first two jobs in speech writing, both of which were total failures. Didn't know how to write. Chief of staff at one of them really urged me to go to law school, so I did. Met a guy named Josh Gaheimer, who is now a congressman from New Jersey, but back then was a law school classmate. We started freelancing together. We got jobs in General West Clark's primary campaign in 03. He lost. John Kerry's presidential campaign in 04. He lost. I uh, became Hillary Clinton's chief speech writer in 08. You'll notice the pattern. She yeah. also lost. Then I got hired on the Obama campaign. Democratic National Convention speech. And then when they went to the White House, worked for him for a couple of years, realized I missed writing for her and switched over to writing for her. That's that's the story. It's quite the journey. Um, a lot of losing initially, and then you started <laughs> a of, winning. That's what, a lot that's, of failures, that, a lot that, of losing. That's what I'm hearing. So tell us how you grew up. Did you grow up religious, not religious? Where, what kind of education did you get? Yeah, so I grew up in a suburb of Boston and definitely not religious. Like we we showed up twice a year at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and I found it to be kind of dull and comprehensible. You know, I went to Hebrew school, you know, didn't love it. And once I had my bat mitzvah, that was that was it. I was kind of done. I was like, you know, culturally Jewish, Jewish by heritage, but I didn't actually want to do anything Jewish. Okay, so that's something that we'll have to get into. What does that mean to do anything Jewish? We'll get into that very soon. Um, but I want to go back to uh, your professional career a little bit. You were President Obama's senior speechwriter, like you mentioned, um, for, for a couple of years and the head speechwriter for the First Lady. Uh, could you give us an insider's view on what it means to be a speechwriter? Yeah, you know, so often people say to me, you know, oh, you put words in the mouth of the Obamas. I'm like, have, have you ever seen these people, right? No one, you know, I'll talk about Mrs. Obama because I worked for her longer. I mean, no one tells Mrs. Obama what to say, right? This is a woman who knows who she is. She knows what she wants to say. And the trick of being her speechwriter is to sit down with her before a speech and say, what do you want to say? Then she would dictate all of this beautiful, moving, vivid language. I would then type as fast as I could to like, like get it down verbatim. I would work that into a draft. And then I would send that around to probably 40 or 50 people in the White House, to lawyers, communications people, policy experts, fact checkers. It was very important for us that everything the Obamas said to the American people was 100 percent accurate and true. That was something that we cared deeply about. So there was a lot of scrubbing of every line of my speeches. And then once I had this scrubbed draft, I would give it to her and we would just go back and forth. Right. She would edit. I would edit her edits. She would edit my edits to her edits back and forth. Sometimes she would read it out loud so I could kind of hear how it sounded. And, you know, I could tell when she didn't like a section or when you know, if a sentence was too clumsy, she might stumble over it. So I would rewrite it. And then after all of that, she would deliver it. So when people say, oh, she seems so real, she, she seems so authentic, it's not seems, right? This is, you know, the speech is really hers from start to finish. Okay, so um, this is going to sound strange, probably, but I think of you as a rebel. Yes, you heard me correct. I think Sarah Hurwitz. A rebel. Uh, the, yeah, you're you're a rebel, <laughs> and I'll tell you why I think you're a rebel. Uh, okay, so you went to. Har it sounds strange. You went to Harvard undergrad. You went to Harvard Law School. Rebellious. You're like yeah, so rebellious. You work in a, in the White House, um, but then all of a sudden you you chose to leave the political world for now and embrace your religion. Um, in such a profound way. And um, that actually seems not just rebellious, but very countercultural to me. Mm. How did your parents respond to that? How did your friends respond to that? How did your colleagues respond to that? 
And maybe what do you tell folks who are on their spiritual journeys right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I think a lot of people were surprised because, you know, after I had my bat mitzvah, I was kind of out. And it wasn't until 25 years later when I broke up with this guy I was seeing, I had all this spare time on my hands. I happened to hear about an intro to Judaism class at the local Jewish community center. And I just signed up to fill my time. It literally could have been like a karate class or a ceramics class. I was just bored and lonely. But what I found there really blew me away. That there was all of this, all of this wisdom about what it means to be human, about how to be a good person, about how to lead a worthy life, about how to find really deep spiritual connection. And I kept thinking like, this was not in the two services I attended each year, right? Like this is, this is something really new and deep. So I, I read hundreds of books, I took classes. And I think, you know, at first I think my friends and family were like worried that I was going to become like religious, right? That I'd become this like extremist, you know, there is this, unfortunately, I think too often the most, the loudest religious voices in our society are, are the most extreme, right? They're the most hateful and ugly. And I think there's a worry when someone becomes religious that they'll become extreme. And but they soon realized, like, no, there's a lot of ways to be a, a really passionate, committed Jew. And I, I was doing it my own way. So I think after a while, they, they thought, oh, this is great. She seems really happy and really fulfilled by this. Yeah, I think I think religious means different things to different people. And I think even the word extremist can mean different things to different people. Um, yeah. it, it's often where you might sit. But um, I want to I want to now talk about something that might seem fundamentalist to, me, to, to many. But I actually think it's um, core to the to the Jewish experience in the most a fundamental and profound way, and that is Shabbat. I want you mm. to give me your 90 second pitch on why Shabbat. Give me the your best marketing mm. pitch. Why Shabbat? Make an argument for why we should all incorporate a little Shabbos in our lives. I like and I like how you said that. A little Shabbos, right? It doesn't have to be the most traditionally, you know, rigorous law abiding. You know, people do Shabbat in all different ways. So I love how you said that. There's a lot of ways to do this. And my argument for this is Shabbat is a protest against so many of the excesses of our modern society. You know, we are constantly inundated with this message that says, you are not enough. You're not rich enough, thin enough, wealthy enough, accomplished enough. You don't have enough likes and retweets on social media. So the answer is you have to work harder, buy more, work harder, spend more, right? Like even when they're telling us to relax, it's like, oh, take a day off by buying this product, by watching Netflix, by going to an amusement park, right? It's like this constant message of just consumerism. And what Judaism says to us on Shabbat is, no, don't consume, don't produce, don't buy, don't work, just stop, rest, decide that you are enough, that you have enough. And it's really radical and really countercultural, right? You're basically saying, no, boss, I'm not going to answer your emails for 25 hours, no social media, I'm not going to get caught up in your not enough game. I'm going to take a break and be present with people I love. And I think we just so desperately need that right now. I think especially at a moment where... So many of us are just constantly online, checking news, feeling this real fear and anxiety just to take a moment to be off is pretty profound. Yeah, I think you in your book, you use the word pause, actually, instead of stop and, re and rest um, yeah. to describe Shabbat. Um, in a minute, just tell us a little bit about that. I just want to make a note to all of the, the viewers. Please uh, make sure you uh, ask some questions and our producer will make sure that they get to me and I will ask them at the end of the episode. But let's get back to you, Sarah. Sarah, yes. um, so why pause? Why pause and not rest, not stop? Why pause? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, rest is part of Shabbat, right? But by the same token, you know, if you're doing this in a very traditional way, you might take the stairs eight flights instead of the elevator. Now that might not exactly be restful, but what it is is it's a total break from the everyday world, right? Like I think I have a lot of respect for people who celebrate Shabbat in a really rigorous way because what they're doing is they're plugging up all the nooks and crannies through which the everyday marketplace world threatens to seep, right? By not using appliances, not using screens, you're just creating this totally different space. It really is as Heschel, as Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel referred to it, it's a sanctuary in time, right? And to create that sanctuary, you got to plug up everything that's threatening to seep in and, and cause noise and, and, and really observe, sort of disrupt the pause. Right, right. I like the word pause. I, I think about that word a lot. Um, yeah. I want to go back. I want to go back uh, for a minute to uh, a crazy question about what life is like as a head speechwriter <laughs> for the most powerful people in the world. Um, so... Let's go back to you, Sarah Hurwitz, the person who is working crazy hours. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, many of us, like you said, get caught up in the world of working psychotic hours yeah. and being insane with what we do. Um, could you tell us your about like some moments of your busiest self? <laughs> yeah, I you know when I was working on Hillary Clinton's campaign in two thousand eight, there was there was one evening when I just was making dinner and I dropped a glass in my kitchen. And I just looked at all these shards on my floor and I was like, I just can't deal with this. I don't have time to clean this up. So I literally left them there for three weeks. I wore flip flops in my kitchen. Um, another time on that campaign, I was waiting for a call, but I had to be in the office in like an hour and I really wanted to take a shower. So I literally put my phone in a Ziploc bag and took it into the shower with me so I wouldn't miss the call. I mean, seriously, <laughs> insane, right? Like that was just... You know, you would be doing, I remember doing a conference call at two in the morning once about a speech. That is just the life of a campaign and it can be very, very crazy. Wow. Um, and I thought being part of a media company was crazy. This, this, <laughs> this is something else, Sarah. Um, next level, right? Next level. I guess that's, that's what life is like in the White House. Okay, <laughs> switching back to um, a little bit of your Jewish story. So I'm going to ask you a question, very Jewish literacy oriented. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite story from the Talmud and why? Mm. Oh, from the Talmud, I like it. So I, I absolutely love the story about how, okay, the story is that Rabbi A gets sick and Rabbi B comes, takes Rabbi A's hand and heals him. Then Rabbi B gets sick and Rabbi C comes and takes Rabbi B hand and, and heals him. Now, the question is, well, if Rabbi B was able to heal Rabbi A, why did he need Rabbi C to come and heal him? Why, why couldn't he just heal himself? And what the rabbis of the Talmud say is the prisoner can't get himself out of prison. Mm -hmm. And I think this is such a beautiful story because so many of us, you find, you, know, you find yourself in a moment where you're imprisoned by your fear, your anxiety, your loneliness, whatever problem it is that you can't solve. And while you may be able to heal others, you really do need someone to come and take your hand and heal you. And so I think that's you know, very, it's a really moving story and one that I've been thinking about a lot these days. I, um, I, I don't mean to be too personal here, but is there is there something is there a particular reason why that stands out to you in terms of you know someone else reaching out um, and giving their hand? Yeah, I mean, I think about you know I, I think about the the challenge of writing a book about Judaism, which was you know I, I was terrified the whole time, like I'm not a rabbi, I'm not a scholar. What if I get things wrong? And I just had so many people who actually are rabbis and scholars reaching out to me and saying, "We got you. We're going to look at it. Don't worry." you can do this. Or, you know, when I was struggling with my chapter on prayer, I had a rabbi who reached out and said, okay, I got some ideas. So that was just to me, really, you know, I couldn't have done it without all of them. Wow. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's something that we all need in life, um, especially yeah. a time like now, um, COVID-19 and me making sure that we reach out to one another, um, that we're not um, more stingy, but more generous, that we're more connected, um, even though we're pretty isolated in many ways. Um, yeah. I want I want to I want to read from a part of your book if you don't mind. So yeah, sure. this is this is Sarah's book. Um, um, it's called Here All Along: Finding Meaning, Spirituality, and a Deeper Connection to Life in Judaism. In parentheses, after finally choosing to look there, I said title. Words. Yes, um, it's okay. You're a speechwriter. You're you're entitled to choosing. That. <laughs> okay, so here's here's a part of your book that I found to be uh, particularly profound. Uh, you said you you cited from a famous Jewish story. Uh, and the Jewish story goes like this. In a small town, a man who disliked the rabbi went about spreading malicious reports about him. At a certain point, the man realized that, while, that what he said was unfair and had immensely damaged the rabbi's reputation. Full of remorse, he confessed to the rabbi that he, what he had done and begged for forgiveness. The rabbi, shocked at what the man had said, told him, go home and take a feather pillow, then go outside, cut it open, and scatter its feathers to the winds. After you have done that, come back to me. The man thought the request bizarre, but relieved that this act would gain the rabbi's forgiveness. Followed the instructions precisely. When he returned, he asked the rabbi, am I, am I now forgiven? One more thing, the rabbi replied. Now go and gather up all the feathers. So why yeah. do you think that's power? That's power. It's power, man. You can't get those feathers back. I mean, so listen. Yeah, so why do you why do you think why do you think gossip is both so enticing? Because it's a story about gossip, obviously. Right. And and why do you think it's both so enticing on the one hand and damaging on the other? Well, first of all, just to step back, this is a story about Jewish ethics, right? Like you might think, like, oh, I'm a good person. I'm, I mean, I don't like cheat or steal. 
But, you know, I'd become, I came to realize, like, well, I might be a good person. When you study Jewish ethics, when you study all the Jewish thinking around speech, I'm like, I'm not really a great person yet. Right? Like, this is, this is actually, like, the, bar, the ethical bar of American society is you do you as long as you don't hurt other people too much. It's like a really low ethical bar. The bar of American law is, you know, like, it, it's just a low bar. So, you know, I think that gossip, it's so tempting because, like, it's a way of connecting with people, right? Like, you want to kind of, like, share intimacies. You want to kind of, you know, talk about people. It's very, it's interesting. But the problem is that you can't get those feathers back. Right. Like if you and I are colleagues and we get into a fight and then I go out and I tell 10 people how much I hate you and you're he's lazy and he's bad at his job and he's dishonest. If we then apologize the next day, well, problem is I just told a bunch of people about you. Terrible things. Maybe they've told a bunch of people who told a bunch of people. Maybe you apply for a job at someone's company that one of those people happens to work at. And they're like, oh, I remember that guy. I heard some things about that guy. Right. It's just it's so dangerous. And Judaism has this whole body of law about how we use our speech. And like, how, how many of us think about that? I had never thought about how I use my speech before I studied the Jewish laws around speech. Right. I, yeah, I think I think that it's a it's a reminder to all of us. Um, something else that you remind us in, in your book, though, is it's it's actually I, I found it to be a little bit. I was unsure where you're going with this is how I'll say it. you said in your book that you wanted to stay away from the topic of anti-Semitism. Um, and yet you write about it. So can you talk about why you chose to write about anti-Semitism? Um, but pause from it for a moment. Yeah. So you look, anti-Semitism, it is real. It is scary. It is rising. Uh, it's incredibly serious. I think anyone who tries to minimize it is really not paying attention to what's going on. Um, but, or I should say, and, you know, I find it so heartbreaking that I see Jews out there whose entire Jewish identity revolves around anti-Semitism. It's like, we should be Jewish because our enemies hate us. I mean, I, I think that the focus on anti-Semitism, it, yeah, it's important, but what about the other 4,000 years of Judaism? I, I think a better argument for Judaism than we should be Jewish because people hate us is we should be Jewish because we have extraordinary wisdom about what it means to be human. We have beautiful holidays and life cycle rituals that add meaning and help us get through challenging moments. We have brilliant theology. We have incredibly wise ethics. We have history and culture and languages and art and music. You know, I, I think it's really important for us to embrace that 4,000 years and to feel such pride and to really learn about it and practice it and embody it. I think that that's actually the best way to fight anti-Semitism rather than just constantly wringing our hands about anti-Semitism. I think the way we fight anti-Semitism is by being proudly, deeply, meaningfully Jewish. So I do write about it in my book, but I want to make room for the rest of Judaism. I think it's important we do that right now. Manny, don't let others define you. You define exactly. yourself. Exactly. Right. Okay. okay. I, 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 that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, um, okay. So what's next for you, Sarah? What are you doing after this book? What do you, what, you like? Know, I think I'd like to write another book. We'll see. I'd like to okay. focus. I know, right? Thinking about... God's spirituality. We'll see. It's 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 a very it's a work in progress. I'm not barely just beginning. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing that book. Um, <laughs> and in the meantime, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play a little okay. game here. It's gonna be a game of word association. Um, okay. It's not something I'm very good at, but that doesn't matter because I get to ask you. So <laughs> it's on you. So here we go. Awesome. Here's okay. Are you ready, Sarah? Ready. Okay. So here's my first word. Okay. Uh, life cycle rituals. Um, okay. I think that oftentimes, okay, I'm going to say, um, oftentimes when we go through a life cycle event in consumer society, the solution is market oriented, right? It's like someone you love died, have an expensive funeral. You're getting married, have an expensive wedding. You're having a baby, buy lots of equipment, but life cycle rituals say, no, 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 no. We're going to create a ritual to draw your community around you and help you get through this. It's not about buying or producing or consuming. It's about really marking this in a meaningful way. So yeah, I'd say anti-consumerist is what I would right. say. Okay. Next, next word or not word, words, Jewish ethics. Jewish ethics. So um, high bar, that's the word that comes to mind because like, I think about that's just the bar of American law. It's like, don't steal people's property, don't physically assault them and don't infringe upon their rights. It's like, there, there's nothing there about like compassion, generosity, kindness, wisdom, maturity, right? Like that's what Jewish ethics offers for us, this much deeper, richer way of being than just this kind of selfish, individualistic, I'm gonna do me and who cares how that affects others. So yeah, high bar. 
Oh, that is, that's good. I like the high bar. How about this one? Here's, here's a word that scares some people. God. Oh, I love this word. No, I'm, I'm into this. Okay. Um, we don't do the best job with this. It's very strange that we show up twice a year at our services or more, if you're more observant, and we say all these names for God and we say all these prayers to God, but we never talk about what we mean. Very odd. It's not shocking when you see a lot of Jews going to like Buddhism, Burning Man, yoga, meditation, because they're looking for, you know, they're rightfully looking for spiritual connection because we have it all in Judaism, right? We have so many different conceptions of the divine that aren't a man in the sky who punishes people, right? That's not the Jewish idea. We actually have a rich, sophisticated, beautiful theology, and we don't have some dogma or some creed that you have to sign up for, right? You see Jewish thinkers throughout history articulating different ideas. You have the mystics who say, God is everything. You're God. I'm God. There's no barrier between us. You have Martin Buber who says that God is what arises between two people in deep relation. You have Mordecai Kaplan who says that God is the process by which we become our highest, truest selves, right? So I would say, okay, sorry, word, but the word that comes to mind, diversity, sophistication, okay. complexity. Okay, diversity, sophistication, complexity. And I would Free also way. add, not that I'm not that I'm being interviewed here. Um, <laughs> there are <laughs> there are that we have some of our great, the greatest thinkers in Judaism of all time have written extensively about the topic and it's worth looking yes. at what they have to say about it. Agree. Um, and not just the topic, God. Okay, in the image. Yes. How do you feel about that? In the uh, image. I think that idea, which comes from reverse the Torah, our key holy text, that is the core animating idea of Judaism, right? This is, I, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg so beautifully articulates it when he says that this idea means that each of us is infinitely worthy. Each of us is totally unique. There's no one else like us and we are all totally equal. And by the way, none of us really truly deeply believe that in our hearts because we've all walked by a homeless person on the street and said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, not today. If that person had been a celebrity, a CEO, that there had even just been a laptop lying on the street, I guarantee you we would have stopped, right? We actually don't in our hearts truly believe that we're all equal and worthy and unique. And that is something that Judaism is constantly trying to call us on. So big fan. Okay, how about this? Um, chesed. Oh, chesed, which means loving kindness and presence. That's the word that the presence would be the word that comes to mind because what chesed demands is um, like a ministry of presence is the phrase that some people have used, which I think is beautiful. It says like when someone you love is sick or in mourning, don't just text them. Don't just send flowers. Actually show up, show up for the shiva, show up in person. Now we cannot do that right now, right? It is not safe. We cannot do that physically but we can absolutely show up for people on the phone. We can absolutely show up and be deeply present for people on our screens, right? So I, I think chesed is more important than ever before right now at this difficult time. And we can do this with the incredible technology that we have. So yeah, presence, okay. presence. But, so then how do you distinguish that from my last word here? Tzedakah, uh -huh. tzedakah, what's the difference? Uh, okay, so tzedakah, which is often mistranslated as charity, it, it actually means justice. And I think that distinction is really important because like charity is something you do out of the kindness of your heart when you feel like it, right? Justice is something you always do. It's like having fair procedures in a courtroom. You don't do that just, you don't give people a jury trial just when you like feel like it, right? You do it all the time because that's what our laws demand. And in Jewish law, sadaka is mandatory, right? It's not optional. It, it's literally mandatory for the, for the functioning of society. And so I I think that mandatoriness is really what's one of the many things that's beautiful about Tadaka. Okay, so I have one, I have two more sections. One is the section I'm calling most. I just came up with most. it right now. It's called most. Okay, <laughs> most. most. Okay, most. And then, and then we're going to end with Q and A from uh, from our audience participation. So awesome. most, just two mosts. Most, uh, most surprising thing you've experienced in Judaism. Um. This, I, I've experienced 12 silent Jewish meditation retreats where Jews, including me, are silent for an entire week. Very surprising that they're able to do that, but it's a really very powerful. Big, big fan. Okay. Surprise, right? Okay, that's a surprise moment. I've never done it, and I don't plan on it. Um, <laughs> You'd love it. But I, maybe I'd be surprised. Um, what's the most inspirational uh, moment you've had in Judaism? You know, um, I, th I think back to one of the Hanukkah parties, the White House, where you had like 700 Jews in the White House and people just spontaneously started singing Ma'ozor, which is Rock of Ages, a traditional Hanukkah song. And I just thought like, my parent, my grandparents, even my parents never could have imagined this. 700 Jews in the United States in the White House singing a song in Hebrew together. 
How, how extraordinary is that? I, I found it really moving. Okay. Um, all right, here we go. Questions from the audience. Okay. okay. I'm going to give a shout out to Jacob from Get Gray Academy of Jewish Education in Canada. Um, awesome. How did being a White House speechwriter influence your book about Judaism? Oh, I love that. I think being a White House speechwriter, it made me realize that so many of the values that I was writing about were actually Jewish values. You know, this in the image idea, I realized, wait a second, every speech I write is articulating that idea. So when I, Mrs. Obama would give a speech about the importance of educating girls in developing countries around the world, she was basically giving a speech about in the image. She was saying, each of these girls is infinitely worthy. They are all equal to every child on this planet, including my daughters. And each of them is totally unique with this unique world of possibility to offer us. So I think that my, you know, my political career and my Jewish journey were very much intertwined. Okay, this is from uh, somebody named Dina. Um, she wants to know what has been the most surprising reaction to your book? You know, it's interesting. I originally thought that my book was more for disengaged Jews. But what I found is that actually Jews who are very, very traditionally observant have been really enthusiastic about my book. You know, many of them have said to me, look, I know a lot about Judaism. And frankly, I don't agree with everything you write, right? We have some disagreements, but I see that you've done your homework and you actually have a lot of fresh insights and perspectives that I haven't thought of. And I see that you love this as much as I do. So I'm, I'm getting these responses from Jews kind of across the spectrum who, even if we don't agree, they see my love and they see the commitment. You know, they see the 550 endnotes, even though the book is very accessible and engaging and conversational and fun. You know, there are 550 endnotes. Like I took it really seriously and did my homework. So I think I'm seeing a real diversity of Jews responding positively and non-Jews too. Christians have told me that I love it. People who are not religious at all. So that's been really moving. That's, that's uh, very inspiring. Okay, I have one more question that I could ask. Um, uh, this is from Shayla. Uh, how do you, how do you, and this is a question I think all of us have, and it's a, it's a question that all of us should be asking ourselves. How do you approach balance of work and life? How do you, how do you do that? Oh, what a great question. You know, I think that, I think that the reality is there's this image that people have when they think of work-life balance where it's like every day will be totally balanced. I'll do X percent of this and Y percent of this and Z percent of this. And I, I don't think that's possible, right? I think some days are a lot of work and some days are less work. And I think the key is for it to balance out over time. But I think if you're trying to balance it out each day, I think that's really challenging. So I think the key is to have more of a, a medium term or a long term approach to balance. Uh, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for your time. I want to give you the opportunity okay. now to plug your book. Plug oh, away. Here it is. Thank plug you. your book. Here it is. So my book is called Here All Along, Finding Meaning, Spirituality, and a Deeper Connection to Life in Judaism. After finally choosing to look there, long title, uh, you can buy it online. There's all different, you know, all different online options to buy it, and it comes in not only hardcover, but also ebook, Kindle, and also audiobook. And I actually read the audiobook, so you would be it's a lot of time to spend with my voice, but that is that's an option as well. So, thank you, Sarah. I want to thank I want to thank you. I want to thank oh, the thank partners. You. I want to thank our. Uh, but we're so excited to partner with all of you and making sure that all of us can be inspired during this time of insecurity and during this time of ambiguity uh, to be inspired from game changers like Sarah Horwitz and the other game changers that are going to be joining us is incredibly um, powerful, incredibly inspirational. Um, so make sure to tune in. Uh, I'm going to check my calendar. Ch tune in on Monday next week, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon p.m. noon Pacific, <laughs> uh, where we'll be hosting the great Yossi Klein Halevi on Monday and the hilarious Elon Gold on Wednesday. Don't forget, please don't forget to follow us on social media. Um, and if you liked what you were doing, consider hitting that like button. It doesn't hurt. Hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe, share with your friends and everyone have a safe and great day. Thank you. Thank you.